Thank you very much for the introduction. So sorry for being late this morning, just the problem of the train. So um, now I want to give you some, uh, as the introduction has shown, uh, I'm a bit old, so I'm going to give, uh, I'm going to give a, a kind of a historical perspective <laughs> on what we have been trying to achieve the last, let's say, 35 years in, in software engineering. Uh, and I would uh, uh, propose that the, the, the thing we're already trying to, to, to do is to try to tame a viability. I'm going to explain that. So there is something which is well known uh, with the software, is this uh, uh, incredible paradox by which writing a simple program is very easy. Anybody can do it. Even a small child, starting five year old or six year old, can start playing with Scratch and write programs that are actually doing stuff, very impressive stuff with, with, with Scratch. And and so, uh, you know, so far it's so easy. But uh, on the other hand, it's also very well known that writing a complex software uh, uh, is so complex that basically nobody is able to do it. And one of the key explanations for that is uh, in this book, The Mythical Man Months, by Fred Brooks, that passed away uh, very recently, uh, last week, but the, the week before. So it's kind of a tribute to him. Uh, basically, the fact that writing a, a 100,000 line program is much more difficult than 1,000 times the effort of writing a 100 line program. So, uh, so there is something due to the size, something due to the complexity. <laughs> and I will claim that the, the, there are actually three dimensions of complexity when you build software. The first one is quite well known in a sense, because it's really at the, at the origin of software, is the inherent complexity of software which is due to invisibility. The fact that even a very small program can have a property that you cannot prove. Uh, and the only way you can deal with that somehow is to try to do some reasoning using proofs, using uh, lighter mechanisms such as design by contracts or even tests to get some uh, confidence into the, the, the software you're, you're making because generally proving uh, an arbitrary piece of, piece of software is just not possible. There is this complexity which is due to the size of the problem, which is uh, uh, the second dimension of complexity. With a difference that was already made by Fred Brooks between the essential complexity, which is the fact that you have to deal with many, many variables, many, many points, uh, functional points, and, and many synchronization, uh, which is the essential complexity of your problem, and the accidental complexity, which is due, which is due to the fact that you're maybe not using the right technology for it, uh, because you have to stay comp remain compatible with <laughs> legacy software or with uh, legacy practices and, and the like. And the only way to deal with complexity due to size in any kind of engineering discipline is basically modularity and abstraction. So you have to cut your difficult problem into small pieces that you can understand without knowing the details, and then you can assemble these pieces to this. That's the, the, the basic idea. Then the third dimension of complexity is due to the fact that basically you don't really know what you're doing. It's the fact that everything is moving. There are many things that are uncertain, and they are uncertain for two reasons. One is the variability in the requirements, in the sense that most of the rules, the business rules, the legal rules, and the human expected behavior is going to change, is going to be misunderstood. And, uh, and, and, and then they're also incomplete, and they evolve over time. So, the, of course, on some domain, you can, I mean, somehow, uh, make a snapshot and try to formalize this thing. But there are very few cases where you have enough resources to do it and to maintain that over time over the chain. And the second uh, issue is that there are also uncertainty in assumptions about the world, in the fact that you believe things that are often wrong. I mean, you believe that this particular uh, library or API is going to behave this way and actually is behave slightly differently. Or uh, there are many cases that are, the corner cases that are very different, very difficult to, 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 to think. And uh, you're not even counting cyber security in the sense that 
uh, when you uh, when you're making mistake because you forgot about this corner case, it's just you know if this corner case happens, it's just bad luck, and then the probability is probably quite low, but still it can happen. Whereas with cyber security, instead of having some kind of random environment, you have an intelligent guy who is actively looking for the uh, the, 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 the the pieces there. So th this is the the the, the, the third dimension that. You do not master basically your environment. I would say neither from the top what is what your so software is supposed to do. You do not really know, and this is why there is this agile stuff by you try to understand what you're doing, and neither from the bottom, which is the platform and actually the thing that you're that you're using is also something that is not very reliable. And so, what are you doing with that? Uh, the only thing is that since things can move. The only way to deal with them is to try to separate the concerns and to uh, do to resort to some kind of viability management to be able to say, to, to to foresee these changes and to prepare the, the, this, uh, the, this variation about legal issues or whatever and say yeah it could be this way or it could be this way let's keep open the two, the, the two possibilities okay one thing that I find interesting is that there has been a book that has been published by engineers at Google recently that's called Software Engineering at Google. Uh, it, it's, it, it's free, so you can download it if you wish. It was published last year, I believe. Uh, and what they, they define software engineering as programming and integrated over time. And I think this definition is not bad in the sense that the, the big difference between writing a program and, and being a software engineer is to know about the, 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 the things that are going to change and you have to make provision for the changes. So viability management, the good old way, I mean, we have been doing that forever. And for instance, using C, there was these techniques uh, of uh, using if def and, and that kind of stuff, where they, there was this tool that is CPP, that is a kind of preprocessor to C, that is defining that if this particular feature is selected, then this block of code should be compiled, or uh, else this other block of code should be compiled. Uh, if we take something like that, there is a big issue because it's hard to manage. For instance, it's impossible to change your mind on whether you want to do that at compile time or at runtime. If you want to do that at runtime, then you have to syntactically change your program. And maybe it's difficult because the if def has a global thing, whereas the if can be in a place that is not that is not legal syntactically. So it's very hard to do to, to do the change, and you need new mechanism for doing that. And as an example, there is this Linux kernel, uh, which has basically one uh, fifteen thousand such features, where there can be block of code that are uh, interfering in, 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 in very many possible configurations. Uh, just to give you an, an idea of the, the complexity of, of that, is that if this feature were independent, that would be two to the power of 15,000, which is more or less 10 to the power of 5,000 number of possible configuration for Linux kernel. So that's a big number. You know that's a big number, but probably you do not know how big it is. So let's let me just try to, 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 to give you an idea of how big it is. So for that, <coughs> I will compare with physics, okay, to show you that our colleague from physics are we have very similar problems. Uh, <laughs> the thing is that, uh, for instance, if we take the notion of atoms and we count how many atoms there is in, in a human cell, we end up with this number 10 uh, to 14. So it means that in the in a human body, there are actually 10 to the 14 also cells, so that's 10 to, uh, 28 atoms in a human body. So if we take the full humanity, it's about 1038, so that's too far. So let's take all the atoms on Earth. Okay, so that's 10 to 50. Okay, that's not enough. So let's take all the atoms in the universe. Okay, that's 1080. Okay, it was too far. So let's go into the other direction. It's just a very big. Let's go to the very, very small. Down to the minimal distance that makes any sense in physics, which is the Planck uh, uh, distance, which is basically 10 minus uh, 35 uh, uh, meters. And uh, in physics, it means that it's, it's impossible to interpret something else, something smaller. 
which means that if it, it is like if the universe were uh, uh, were uh, discrete, and there could be uh, any number of places that are separated by this by, by this distance. And uh, which is mean that if the, the volume of the observable universe is that number, 10 to the power of 80 uh, square uh, meter uh, cube, uh, then it means that the number of possible places in the universe would be 10 to the power of 115, which is still far. So it means that to all the, all the possible configuration of the Linux kernel, you will need uh, something like 10 to the power of 43 <laughs> parallel universes. Okay. So that gives you an idea, and next time you discuss with, with your colleague from physics, you can tell them that they are just simple problems. <laughs> <laughs> That's very useful when there's budget in the university. <laughs> <laughs> and so getting back to our point, uh, when you have to manage both complexity of the size is modularity and abstraction and separation of concern viability management. That's really uh, what have been at the heart of uh, uh, object oriented modeling and model engineering from the very beginning. So, really combining these two things. Okay. And what I'm going to do now is to see how these ideas has been, have been used in practice to try to solve these problems. And I would say that there are five ages of model driven engineering starting in the, in the late 80s with, with uh, computer-assisted software engineering tools at the time. Uh, with all of that, including machine learning now. Um, and uh, of course, uh, uh, when there is an age, it does not stop with the other one. I mean, people are using case tools and all of that is there. But there, there is a peak time for, for, for this. Thing. So let's start with case tools. What was the goal of the case tools in the, in the, in the late 80s, early 90s? It was really, uh, I mean, my experience, I've been working in the telecom industry at the time. It was really trying to address viability in the specification of protocols. We were trying to build uh, protocols for networks, for many things, for space probes, for many places. And designing a protocol the right way was very difficult because of the, all the possible implications that, that were there. And the idea was that if you're doing that at the C level or even assembly level at the time, it was too complex to reason. So it was needed to have a higher level of reasoning by which you could uh, basically uh, do some reasoning for that. And there were a number of, of tools for that. They were called formal description techniques, uh, for instance, Estelle or SDL or Lotus is there. And uh, already at that time, during the, the 80s, they, they already had these features such as graphical and textual editor. For instance, in SDL, you could switch from the graphical to the textual editor. Uh, that was very easy. They were able to do some consistency checking. And above all, they were able to do some kind of validation with the first simulators and the development of the method that was called model checking at the time, uh, that was really exploring all the possible uh, uh, state of, of, uh, of a system. And then, uh, once all of that was well done, you could resort to code generation to actually obtain your, your, your program. So what was good with that is that it was possible to program complex distributed computer at a very high level of abstraction with a high level of confidence in the validity of the code because you could start with a, a simulation and a model checking of what you were doing. Um, <coughs> And there was a clear separation between the essential complexity, which is the, 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 the complexity of the protocol itself to, to manage something, with the accidental complexity of its programming in C or assembly language. So it was much easier to change your mind with the specification because you could just I mean, validate it again and, and push the button and get a new code. So it, it was working pretty well. So what was the bad side of it? Well, uh, one first thing is that most of these techniques were highly abstract and somehow mathematically uh, driven. And for a number of, tech, of engineers uh, in the telecom industry, at least, it was too difficult because it was not their way of thinking about the software or even about the protocols. And the learning curve wa was too big, and basically, people tried to avoid to do it. Uh, and then, from, that was one side. But for me, the biggest issue was the fact that at that time the code generators from these languages were black boxes. 
and sometimes very expensive black boxes because it was before the the the, the uh, the open source movement and, and everything. <laughs> and so you had to buy it and you had to buy it for several thousand of, your, of euros or whatever. And uh, so, um, uh, and then you use it and then it gives you some results. And sometimes this result is fine and it's perfect. And there are many uh, success stories of using, but sometimes it means something, typically something which is about non-functional issues such as the speed or the capacity of the code, because most of the systems were embedded systems, or the memory footprint, or the usage, or the interface with legacy software. And because the code generator was black box, it meant that you were just stuck. Okay, but people in the telecom engineer in the telecom industry, they were engineers, so they want to they do not want to be stuck. So what they do is then they take the output of the code generator and start hacking. For instance, I mean in uh, in, 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 uh, I've been working with a, a French telecom company, I won't give the name, uh, where they were actually doing that for a real deployment of so, some, some uh, protocol uh, software. And at some point, the time it took to run the transition was too long <coughs> with the processor that they were using, so that they, didn't, they did not meet the, the real time uh, constraints. So they decided to break, the, the, to break a piece of code, which was a transition into two parts. And they solved the problem because then it was fast enough. But then they did not realize that all the validation, all the model checking was based on the ID that the transition were, were uh, atomic. Mm -hmm. And their stuff was no longer atomic. And at some point, it crashed the full network. I was there. <laughs> I analyzed this particular bug. And so, okay. And the bottom line is that uh, it was not. That was the trouble, and basically they, they stopped doing it, and they, they started to coding everything in C again. Then the second age came with the well-known monodriven architecture that started in the mid '90s until the mid 2000s, uh, which was promoted by the OMG with this uh, wonderful uh, logo here. And uh, of course, the idea of the NDA was to to explicitly address the viability of the platform. You have the same behavior, the same business objects, and then you want to put them on different platforms. Okay. So the idea of, uh, of the NDA was to separate the fundamental logic uh, behind a specification from the specifics of, of a particular middleware that implements it. The main concepts were a number of models. Most interesting were the platform independent model and the platform specific model. And there was something called the platform description model. And the underlying idea of the NDA was that you could describe a platform independent model, you can describe a platform uh, description model, and you can basically merge together to get a platform specific model. That's the why, what they call the, the, the why uh, life cycle. And so it's this merging that should give you something. And this is done with model transformation, hence the, the beginning and the the, the the I would say the spring of model transformation of the many transformation languages that we uh, we have until today. So what was the good thing of MDA? The good thing is of course portability because it was supposed to work this way. Cross platform interoperability, platform independence, somehow domain specificity because you could capitalize on object on, on object from a given domain and then deploy them uh, on different platforms. And supposedly uh, productivity because you basically write it once and deploy them to many places. If you have many uh, platform description models, you can basically uh, merge it with a single platform in a model and get many, many different implementations. <clears throat> what was the limitation? Well, the, limit, the first limitation is that uh, MDA is mostly a forward engineering approach, meaning that. Uh, model are transformed into uh, implementation artifacts. But the thing is that platform description models do not exist in reality. They are just a conceptual ID, okay, which is fine, but there is no concrete thing such as a platform ID. <laughs> as a platform description, nobody has it. I mean, it's too complex. Nobody even knows how, how to do it. So the description of the platform is only in the head of the technical people. And the way they verify this knowledge 
is basically by putting a kind of model transformation that if I know that I want to target, uh, let's say, Microsoft.NET, then because I know this platform, I know the kind of code that must be generated for Microsoft.NET. So all the knowledge of the platform is actually in the model transformation, not as a reified thing. So it means that this thing does not exist. Okay. Or very seldom exist. <laughs> They, they might be special cases, I mean, but most of the time it's not, it does not really exist. Uh, as it's. And because of that, not, not everything can be captured in the source model because some knowledge is, you know, in the transformation or somewhere. And uh, sometimes you have to modify the code that has been generated, which is always a nightmare because even if there are conventions and places where you can, you know, some su tool support is still uh, an engineering nightmare and nobody Nobody is a big, big but it, it's very hard to do it right, actually. Uh, to keep sync between the, the, the part that you modify and, uh, and, uh, and the, the, the part that, that, that are generated. So the thing is that the know how is not just in the PIM, in the platform in the model. There, there is some business know how there, but there is a lot of know how in the way you go from the PIM to the PSM. And sometimes, I mean, the transformation are much more complex than the PIM. I've been working uh, at that time with, with Thales, for instance, and we were working on air traffic control. And actually, the PIM for air, air traffic control is very simple. It just preserves one invariant, and it fits on one screen. But in the end, you get a, a, a huge program, uh, mil, several million lines of C++ doing a lot of things because there are many stakeholders, many, many things. and and. And then somehow the, 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 the real knowledge of a company building an air traffic control system is in the technical side, not on the PIM side, which is the high level business model of what is air traffic control. And then uh, uh, this thing is that it's very, very big and it's not done at the right level of abstraction because the language that we have for model transformation, they are meant, they, are, they, they work pretty well for very simple cases, but when you have large and very big software, then they just fail. And uh, they are hard to use at a, 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 a scale, they cannot compete with model, modern programming languages, and actually for me, they are just a bit of them. Okay, so NDA is dead. So, <laughs> Uh, but not all the ideas are wrong. I mean, the idea of separating something is good. Separating the platform aspect is good. But the thing is that it's not just one aspect to be separated. You need to separate many different things. And so that was the idea between the early 2000 and the mid 2010s of trying to really work with separation of concern, taking it seriously with this notion of aspects in particular. And so the idea is that if you can separate the concerns into aspects and then use uh, uh, product line uh, IDs such as um, feature modeling to choose which aspect you want at a given time, then you can weave them back and get many different things. And so the idea here is that we do not just want to separate the aspect, the, the, the platform aspect, but any kind of possible aspect. And for that, the model is the right thing to use because a simple definition of, of a model that I like much is the fact that a model is an abstraction of an aspect of reality for a given uh, purpose, which means that a model is multidimensional, has separation of concern built in, and then we need to have some kind of explicit management of variability, for instance, using uh, feature diagrams like this one. So what is the ID, the underlying ID uh, of using uh, modeling? And separation of concern is that when you have a complex system, you're going to have many different kind of models. Okay, uh, models for for uh, object, model for use cases, model for quality of service, model for security, model for uh, platform, for user interface, whatever. And the uh, design process that everybody is using, this is not just uh, in the modeling, is that when you separate all the aspects, what you're doing is that you put all these concerns together into something that is the design model that is going to be translated to code somehow. But the value is not here. The value is in the, in the right part. And, it's, and the thing is that 
I want to have all viability because I want to have many different platforms or maybe many different security models. And if I'm doing this weaving by hand, I mean, my head, the thing is that it's a complex process. I mean, most people have managed to do it at, at a small scale, but it's hard to do at a large scale. And, 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 and it's very uh, uh, intelligent in sense, uh, uh, intensive in a sense, because you, you really have to think hard about all, how it fits together. So the idea of ND, in a sense, is to automate this process. I mean, the idea is that uh, all these models are no longer documentation that I use in my head to produce this design model, but they are actually data that are inputs to a program that is going to produce this design model. And the, the key selling point is that because they are data, I'm changing the data, I click again on the, on the compile button and I get a very different design from which I can have a different code. Okay. So this is the, the, the real, for me, the real underlying ID of, of uh, underlying ID of MDE. And it's, of, of course, a, a very big connection with product families and uh, with automatic weaving and aspect <coughs> in, in our world. So for doing that, there is this notion of feature modeling for knowing which variant you want and what are the constraints among the variants. So this is a very active field for many, many, many years. And the connection is there, is that you choose these things. And uh, with this orthogonal variability, the idea is that you can describe your, your base model, which is uh, something like your main model or let's say a Java program, whatever. Uh, you have a variability model that describes which part must be changed and you have something that is called uh, um, uh, resolution model that choose specific options and compose it in a way that basically gives you a resolved model uh, and produce you many, many different uh, products uh, in the same product line. <clears throat> so, what is good there uh, with this idea is that bottling is really the activity of separating concerns into aspects and to try to abstract in a way. So that's really the, 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 the nature of modeling is this one. And the design, considering that, modeling is separating your concerns and design is weaving them back together uh, when you choose the, 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 the large solution, for instance, using design patterns or other kind of stuff. And MDE is really about mechanizing this design process, making it possible to change and to have many different uh, variations or products. Uh, and it's even possible to delay the decision until runtime of which aspects should be used to solve the problem. And then what you get is a very nice uh, uh, abstraction of, of, uh, of a dynamically adaptive system in the form of dynamics of our product line. Okay, so the link is very well, well made and, and the abstraction is very good and you can basically use exactly the same techniques to handle uh, uh, self-adaptive systems uh, in that particular sense. Okay, what is not so good? Well, it's the, what is not so good is mainly the fact that it's still a dream. It's really not reality. Because even me separating the concern of a system is not always completely straightforward. It needs a very deep understanding uh, of everything, and if you want to do it, you have to spend a lot of time. And typically, uh, it's a lot of upfront investment. Okay, so it's difficult to that. And still, it's it's the, the good thing is it's somehow it's proportional to the, to the inherent complexity of your program. If your program is simple, it's not that difficult. If your program is very complex, it's very difficult. Uh, but it needs some kind of upfront upfront investment, and the, your program is going to move. And so it's not always worth the trouble for doing that. And then, which is probably the biggest issue, is that uh, within a single aspect is very straightforward. It works magically well and is very easy to implement. Uh, but within a second one, or well, within a second one at a different place in your software is still easy. But if you try to weave it at the same place, then you have big problems. And this is why aspects fail in the end. Because here, uh, you, you, you end up with very difficult problems uh, of, uh, in, with the fact that depending on the 
on, on the order. You're doing the weaving, you get different results. And sometimes these different results make sense, sometimes they do not make sense. And we have, when you have a, pro, a complex issue, then there is no good ordering. And, and it's very hard to master what is going to be the output of that. And basically, the abstraction is not good because it does not provide the basic thing that we are used to do in mathematics, which is associativity and commutativity. And aspects are not in, are neither associative nor commutative. And then it's a nightmare for, for, for software composition. And for me, it, it's not just for me, but for many people, it's really the root cause of aspect failing for that, even if they are still there in some, some places, such as uh, um, Spring Boot, uh, AOP, for instance, they are still used, of course. Failing does not mean that it never works. It means that it cannot work in general. Somehow. Okay. And so there is no hope for full, fully general purpose, metamodal independent model aspect, uh, model level aspect reverb. Uh, I already tried to do that for several years and just like that. I could not do it. Maybe I'm not smart enough, but I'm not sure it's, it's, it's feasible. Still, some specific solution in a specific context might exist. So it's not, I mean, it's not that the idea is completely wrong, it's that it's still, we, we still do not have the, the right abstraction because if we would get back to that, of course, we will need uh, a notion that is a little bit different from aspect that has this property of associativity and commutativity, and then things would be much easier. But we are still not there. So it's still open research. So what are we going to do? Well, it's impossible to read aspects. So let's do what computer scientists are doing. Let's go meta. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so instead of doing it at the level of the software, let's do it at the level of the meta model or the language or whatever you call it. I mean, and uh, we're going to resort to languages and to try to do the composition of languages instead of doing the composition of software. So we want, this is the idea of uh, domain-specific languages and software language engineering, where we want to provide the language for each stakeholder to express the variable problem and solution. And then because the stakeholder uh, has that, uh, it can, uh, there is this big separation of concern because each concern is, uh, is, uh, is uh, used with a, a specific uh, uh, domain specific language, and then I can express the fact that sometimes I want it this way and sometimes I want it that way, and then the environment is going to compose all of that. So we lift the problem at the metabolic level. Uh, this is not a new idea. I mean, uh, there is a citation that uh, another lesson we should have learned from the recent past is that the development of richer or more powerful programming languages was made a mistake in the sense that these baroque monstrosities, this conglomeration of idiosyncrasies, are really unmanageable, both me mechanically and mentally. I see a great future for very systematic and very modest programming languages. Okay, you probably know who say that. No, you know, you don't know? Well, it's not about C++. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was about Al Gore. And the guy who say that was in 72, it was Jigstra during a history lecture. So it's not a new idea. Okay. Uh, domain specific languages, shortly speaking, the idea is that instead of having a, a Swiss knife that is doing everything but not that well, we have a, a, a set of tools, each doing a specific <laughs> job in a much better way. Okay, that's a short thing. So they are targeted to a particular kind of problem. Uh, with dedicated notation that could be textual or graphical or other, and with specific support. And the promise is to be more efficient for solving a set of specific problems in a given domain. And each concern is described with its own language, and the idea is to reduce the abstraction gap between the, the people who are trying to solve the problem at their abstraction level that could, that could be, let's say, lawyers or, 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 or medic, medics or whatever, depending on the domain, or uh, aerospace engineers. Uh, they want to think into that domain and probably not to program into C++. And uh, that has led to the emergence of this field that is called uh, nowadays software language engineering. There is a conference with that name, which is basically the idea of uh, trying to apply in a systematic way, in a disciplined way, 
uh, for the development, use, deployment, and maintenance of software languages. Uh, just to give you an idea, even in, in simple contexts such as developing for for the web, which is typically seen from an engineering point of view as, as the, uh, an easy uh, an easy job compared to let's say flying a, flying an airplane or, or running a car, uh, there is this example of, of Jester, uh, which is a platform to de to develop uh, uh, and deploy Spring Boot and Angular web applications uh, and uh, Spring mi mi microservices. Uh, which is really uh, modern kind of using the very last technology and everything. And if you try to see how it works, they actually use 40, more than 40 different DSLs to produce, I mean, a simple web application. And, uh, uh, and of course, it's, it's a generative platform. You have to describe all your stuff and then you push a button and then combine everything to the, to the website that you want. And the funny thing with that is that the, the head developer of Jabster, uh, who is basically using this concept of uh, many languages, uh, generative approaches, uh, model-driven engineering, does not believe in model-driven engineering. He's <laughs> actually using it on a daily basis. So, okay, so what are these languages? Okay, it's not no mystery. HTML is a DSL, CSS, SQL, Maven, uh, like HTTP, all of that are, 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 are languages, Redex, uh, and so on. Uh, so what is now possible is that there is a big difference between now and the past is that now we have workbenches that make it quite easy to develop new languages. Uh, there are first class entities. And you can even decompose the language on small into small parts and try to reuse parts of your language to build a new language. For instance, in most languages, you need, let's say, a sub-language for managing arithmetic expression, you know, A plus B plus C times Z and whatever. And it's always the same. So why rewrite re re a parser, an editor, a compiler, an interpreter for that? You could just reuse that part of a language into a new language. So this is the goal of something called a melange, that is basically decomposing a language into sub-languages and then you can assemble your own language. So, and it's not just developing one language, it's developing a set of cooperative languages because the thing is that if you separate all the concerns, uh, you do not want your, you, you want to keep your DSL quite simple so that a given stakeholder can use this language and then you want to have this language cooperate together to provide the full, uh, the, the, the full service. And so there is this, idea of the globalization of model of model modeling languages by which you define how they cooperate how they cooperate in terms of semantics which means that how you can build an interpreter or, or compiler or model transformation from the language uh, and of course you know the, the, there are plenty of things uh, there is this book uh, explaining some of that and uh, linking to a talk of this morning actually uh, uh, for building information uh, uh, for the beam building information models is not that foreign because one of the chapters of the book is actually on beam, so you know that it's not that uh, that uh, that different in my opinion. Okay, so what is the good part of uh, using DSL and software language engineering? Is that you have tools for doing that that are already providing I mean, one, one example is uh, the Gmox CPU, but there are many others that are programming meta programming approaches in you know, associated execution engine to design these, these languages. And they, they are providing some kind of, of, uh, of transverse services such as uh, trust management, uh, animation, uh, interpretation, and the like. And it's an extensible framework to add new languages and new, uh, new, uh, new, new formalism to that. And you can even cooperate, make cooperate something that is uh, coming from physics, such as uh, uh, equations, differential equations, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, state-based languages, and you can make them cooperate in a, in a nice way, and, and so on. So it's really the idea of, of, of cooperation. What is not so good, what is not completely solved, is that uh, one thing is that uh, when I'm saying that we are building languages, concretely speaking, what we are building is software. We are building parser, editors, 
interpreters, compilers, whatever. And so software languages, they are software. And so they suffer from all the same difficulties that we are in building software. We need to uh, have all these things about maintenance, evolution, user experience, and still we need to have specialized knowledge to conduct the development of context, co complex artifacts such as grammars, metamodels, interpreters, type systems, and so on. There have been a, a huge progress since Digital's time, because at that time there were not even uh, in 72, uh, even Lack and, uh, Yak and Lex were not invented yet. So it was, I mean, creating a language was really something only a genius could do. Okay. Starting in the 80s, it was, I mean, something that a PhD student could do because of this support. And the goal nowadays is that any engineer, any software engineer, can create its own language. So that's one issue. And the second issue is that the globalization of DSL, the way you make them cooperate, uh, uh, is not so easy either. Of course, it's inherent uh, complexity, but uh, the, the, the relationship between different languages and the way they should cooperate is, is and the, it's really the core of the difficulty here. And uh, it's not easy to do. The, you, you can do it, but it needs, uh, you, you need to put a lot of effort into that. And once again, it's upfront effort because designing a language, you have to know beforehand how it's going to be used and how are you how are you going to compose it with the, the, the other languages? Okay. Um, yes. That's all. That's it. So now getting to the last part, which is uh, what are the, the, the thing we are doing now? Uh, I would say that we are trying to handle data centric social technical systems. And here, where is the variability? The variability is that you do not even know the model. You learn them on the go. So this is the variability. You have to learn what you want to do from the data. So it brings forward a new, new kind of models. What we have been thinking, and when we, are, we were talking before, we were mostly talking about engineering models. Engineering models were there to describe what should be implemented. I mean, whatever the domain, I mean, whether you're building a, 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 an aircraft or a car or a website, the model is there to prescribe how it should be built. And once it's built, the model becomes descriptive, provided it's kept in sync with what you're being building. So there is this idea of engineering model as the description, what should be done, and then the description of what has been done. So that's one use for models. But then models are used for in, in many, many other uh, uh, activities, such as for scientific models. Because basically, the theory of science is the idea that you're going to build a model to explain a reality. So the model is used to represent some aspect of a, of a phenomenon of a real world. And it is destructive. For instance, there is this, you know, the story of Newton looking at the people falling from the tree. And it looks at that and then build a model. Uh, it builds a model to describe that kind of reality. And the model is basically good enough, provided uh, the, the app world is not too, mass, ma too, too massive and the speed is not reaching the speed of light. And if you, and the, the, the things are big enough, so you do not have a quantum physics theory or whatever. And then the model is good enough. And because it's good enough, then it's not, not just descriptive, it can be predictive in the sense that you can basically uh, uh, have this apple on the tree, and because of the model, you can estimate what would be the, the, the speed of the apple when it, it falls on, on, uh, on Earth. Because of math, because the model is basically mathematics. The mathematics are quite powerful, at least until some point, because they make it possible to predict that when you have two bodies. But the limit of mathematics is that when you have three bodies, you can still have the equation, but it's impossible from a mathematical point of view to give you to give an analytical solution to that equation. Okay. So what people are doing when there are three bodies, such as you know the, the moon, the earth, and another big uh, thing, such as the sun. Well, well, this example is not good because you could neglect. But basically, if you have three bodies of equals of equal uh, mass in, in, in free space, 
then there is no analytical solution for solving that. So what we are doing is going to solve it with a, with a kind of simulation by dividing the time with small steps and trying to solve the equation at all each step. And so this is the idea of computer-based simulation by which the model, which is descriptive of reality, uh, becomes predictive because then you can use the model and ask the model a question and get the answer that is close enough to reality that you can actually use the model. And because if this is used in a simulation, uh, somehow this model becomes an engineering model because it is implemented and it describes the nature of your software. So you see that a model can have different nature depending on how you consider it. And then there is another category of model, which are the inductive models that are built typically from data. You do not know beforehand, and you use machine learning to do that. And these models, they are descriptive from the past, because of course you have the data on the past, so the model is supposed to describe the past. They are predictive. If you want to, do, to use them, because in your domain, the past is something that has no reason to change in the future. So if that particular train arrived at that hour yesterday, probably is going to arrive at the same hour today, more or less. <laughs> and uh, the thing is that because it's predictive, once again, you can turn it into a computer program and then become prescriptive, knowing that uh, you know there, there is this fast recognition. You can learn it from the from the past. I can predict that it is you or not you. And then because if it is you, then I open the door or I uh, do something with your face. So what is the organization of all of that? Well, we have worked uh, with many colleagues on something that we call the, the modal framework, which is the modal driven engineering for data centric systems. It tries to capture the essence of how we build systems with data somehow. And there is a generic model by which there is you're, you're supposed to, to produce a running system, which is there. And this running system is actually processing data from the universe and uh, producing data and also producing some kind of measurement. Okay? And there is also some external data. And from this data, you can use this data to, uh, cali to generalize and calibrate and somehow have a descriptive model of your session technical system in which your only, your only software is, is, um, is running. From this descriptive model, you can turn it into a predictive model using normal machine learning. And then if you're using this predictive model to uh, change the behavior here, it becomes a prescriptive model by which you can produce a new version of the software to do the thing you want to do. So we claim that this model is quite general in the sense that it can explain a lot of things that we are doing in software in many different contexts. For instance, an agile method or iterative method always starts with data, and the data here is user stories, what we want to achieve. From this data, we're going to build a descriptive model that can be a requirement, use cases, or actual uh, uh, user stories that try to capture in a semi-formal way <coughs> what, we, what is supposed to achieve. So it describes the behavior of what you want to achieve, and then turn it to a prescriptive model, which is the design implementation, and then the first time it a prototype or an MVP of your of your system. And you look at the MVP, and then you are ah, this thing is good, this thing is not so good. I want to change that. I want to bring a new ID, and then you this is the typical agile uh, life cycle, starting with the data. Producing data, observing the behavior of the software, turning that into new user stories that you want to implement again and again. Now, <clears throat> if we look at how machine learning is used, we also start with the data, which is much less structured than, than user stories. So there is a data cleaning phase, and we want to build from this data a descriptive model. Uh, which is the cleaning, and then from this descriptive data, we, we train, uh, let's say, for instance, a neural network or whatever, to get a predictive model, and then we get a prescriptive model if we want to use that neural network to uh, recognize your face and, and trigger something, such as opening a door. Uh, a digital twin 
Uh, the idea is that you have some software that is producing data. The data is observed in the descriptive way. If it, uh, if it does not behave in the, in, in, the, in the right way, you want to correct it, and then you want to uh, update the digital print to, 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 adopt, to adopt a new behavior, and so on and so forth, which is also the case of adaptive system, which is basically the same, the same picture. So I'm going to refer to this. And so one of the challenges uh, of that is that even if the conceptual framework is the same for everybody, uh, uh, it means that uh, uh, how do you do it in practice? So we have been running this experiment with the, 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 the transportation framework of the, the city, uh, the transportation network, the bus network of the city of Rennes, with the company Curis. Uh, and we have this data, this data time framework, which is basically trying to mix machine learning with uh, normal engineering models. There is no point in trying to learn uh, the topology of the network. The topology of the network is known. So how you combine this? And the idea is that this is the topology of the network, and then you, you, you get access to all the, 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 the timing of all the buses for several months, and then we want to know what will be the, 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 the speed and the, the, the place of a given bus at any given time in the future. And the idea of the of the of the data time framework is to make it possible to the normal engineers at Curis to actually use this thing as if they were the same thing because as it, as it has been said in the morning the main tool that these people are using is excel okay and so they sit on pile of data that they does not fit into excel so they do not need they do not know how to manage manage it and so they cannot import it to excel so it does not exist and so the idea is to give them, uh, under the same interface, an access to the data of the past, which is the database on the data lake, the data, the data know where is this bus, what is the speed of this bus, and what will be uh, the speed of the bus tomorrow at the same place or at a different place. In the case, for instance, the, the bus is, is uh, there, there is a, the, 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 there are works on the road and they, they have to define a new uh, a new uh, road, a, a new uh, direction for, for, for the bus. Uh, then they want to estimate what will be the time, and because we can report what we have learned on a given on a given segment, then it's possible to, to do that at the level of abstraction of you know just asking what is the speed of the bus, whether it's in the future or in the past. <coughs> so there are many many issues for doing that, but. There is, if you're interested, we have published this paper in, in models, and there is an extension uh, of the paper in SOSIM uh, for, for all of that. And the, and the, the good thing, the, the, what was possible for them is all these what if scenarios of building new lines and knowing in advance how much time it will take to, to run a bus on, on these new lines. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.